<laughs> oh no, we don't have a cold open. Usually, I do this when we're like in the middle of talking. Cold like, open, yeah. Well, I was gonna. I was gonna <laughs> what is our cold open? What are we? Uh, cold catfish? Open, cold are open. we talking about catfish? We're what talking we? about. Mm, yeah. Wait, hold on. Okay. Is struggling to come up with a cold open? Is a this? Cold open? Is this us transitioning oh, art no. into a brand? Are We've, we? We were the monsters the whole time. We're, just in, we're deconstructing our own <laughs> cold opens, Jay. I just got Inception. <laughs> that means we're becoming a brand. I'm, I'm trapped in a glass box oh, no. of emotion. Oh, all right. So, hey, everybody. Welcome to part two of what we're going to call, I think, probably the Grimdark Media Starter Pack, which is where we're going to talk about the timeline of art turning into brands. Um, and this is like a really useful thing. I think not just to talk about from the point of view of obviously we're trying to set up context for the things we're going to make in the future. Sure. You and I are trying to have a conversation that lets us, that we can refer back to basically when we talk about like the timeline and we talk about media in general. But I think this is actually useful for giving an appreciation perspective on why doesn't that thing that I used to like feel the same anymore? I also think putting consciousness of thought behind it prevents if it doesn't present, prevent it, at least recontextualizes the old man yells at clouds to, clouds thing, right? Yeah. Because it's it's perfectly okay for you know an older long term fan to not see the new version of something the way that a new fan sees it. But by the same token, I think a lot of us older long term fans should get off our high horse mm -hmm. and let new fans unironically enjoy the things exactly. they want to enjoy. Exactly. And and being conscious of, of where you see transitions means you can see it in two different contexts without, again, shaking your fist at the clouds because it's just not the way you remember. Yep, exactly. And then it's not for you anymore and that's okay. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a really like, that, it, it, I, I don't think either of us are trying to come off as like enlightened lotus eaters no, in this regard. No, But it's 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 like therapy for your hobbies where you're working through something and you're like, oh, okay, I can still like the thing I like. And, and you can, and like, you the can like the thing, thing that you, you like. like. Exactly. Yeah. Or you can like the thing that I like, what it's transformed into. And that's also okay. And we can accept that it's not for me. And I can say that not dispassionately. I can still be passionate about that thing, sure. but I can maybe enjoy it in a different way or appreciate it differently from the way I used to enjoy it. Absolutely. So what we've done is we've come up with, it's, it's funny because there's four stages, but the final stage actually has its own four stages because that's like the metamorphosis stage where something becomes a product effectively, a brand. Um, and we wanted to break down from concept to like transfiguration, the, the stages that something goes for from being art into being a product. And this has been done before in different ways, with different terms, we're creating our own language that we can agree upon yeah, now absolutely. of how this works. This is by no means a, a definitive set of languages and terms. This is our set of languages and terms. This is all based upon the stuff I learned in art school and in, in writing school um, and our, both of our experience just consuming media for way too long. And I, and I think it's important so that again, when you're, when you're listening to, to older people talking about things that have been around for a long time, it's, it's important for us to kind of not be dunking on things yeah. like just cause it's not for us anymore. I don't want to be dunking on it, but I still want to be able to speak to the point where I feel something transition from mm -hmm. art to being a brand. Yeah, exactly. And and because we're both passionate guys, we often deal in hyperbole because it's fun to speak that way and it's fun to use those <laughs> words. Um, and if you're on the internet, it's profitable. <laughs> yep. If I can hook you in the first 30, if you didn't get hooked in the first 30 seconds of this video uh, and you left, you're not going to hear me say that, did you know that if in the first 30 seconds you can make a hyperbolic please. statement and, and, and get something? I, I was going to say, please suggest your, uh, your rage bait <laughs> titles in the comments That's below. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we should do that. We should let the people, we should let the viewers suggest new titles for my videos that are more rage. Why everything is bad and yeah. it will all end soon. <laughs> this might be the best kept secret of why everything sucks. Um, <laughs> so I think often what happens is our need to trade our talents for money cause this transition. If I was to go all the way back to the beginning, Art is art. And some artists are able to walk away from their art and leave it alone and go on to make new art. Very often though, because we live in a post-capitalist society, right. or not, we don't live in a post-capitalist society, um, we have to trade art for income. And so very often, so, the thing that someone creates gets turned into a product and commodified. And this process is worth talking about. 
Um, those that didn't usually die in the gutter. Uh, so you've got like Gauguin or Monet or Van Gogh, probably the most famous examples of impoverished artists who died and whose art was then later on sold for hundreds of millions of dollars that they never saw a penny. And of. for those of you that, that want to see art as something other than traditional graphic art, how about Lovecraft? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Lovecraft died penniless. And his work, his writing during his lifetime was all considered crap by 99.99% of the population. And now it's, it's, it's a brand. It, it is. It's, it's a brand. It's some of the most influential cosmic and crazy art I think ever created. If I say Lovecraft, I don't have to provide any more context. No, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's the word has, has, has transcended to become a, a, its own meaning. Like Lovecraftian is as powerful a term as grimdark is now. You know what I mean? Like, it, and it was powerful long before Grimdark was a title and actually probably is one of the ancestors of Grimdark. Um, so while it's far from official, we've defined these artistic development stages and it's for the purposes of us being able to communicate them in the future. But the four stages are innovation, codification, deconstruction, and then finally branding. Um, and then what happens after that? Well, once you become a brand, then you enter a whole new and somewhat cynical lifestyle of being a product. Yeah. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. Um, and this will hopefully help you guys. We're, uh, we don't want to talk about just one line here. We're going to try and refer to as many different pieces of media as possible so that we're not just dunking on a single Because, and, and just to be crystal clear, completely transparent, it's because if you're a fan of the channel and you've come here for all the previous content, yeah. It probably feels like you know where this is going to end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's certainly not our point, and yeah. we're going to try and keep it from ending. Yeah. There. And, and the final thing to sort of like highlight here is that this is okay. There isn't, I'm not trying to say that this process is wrong. I think it is the natural outgrowth of people needing to be paid for what they create to survive in a world where you need to trade. Money yeah, personally, food. I like to eat food and live in a house. Um, so I, I'm I'm hard pressed to begrudge other people who also yeah. like to eat food and live in a house. And I'm not unaware of the irony that I'm going to get paid by my patrons to make this content, right? So like this is this is me this is me being both self aware and also trying to warn that the point of this isn't to indict. The point of this is to help people process and contextualize the things they like to consume, whether Wait it's a minute art, whether it's music, whether it's uh, writing or games, all of those things I consider to be art. So if you get paid for this and I don't, yeah, I'm the artist. You are the artist. And Sweet. I'm, and I'm the machine. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I'm going to rage against you later. <laughs> That's fair enough. I pay you in coffee. Um, so uh, let's jump in then and start about, talk about stage one, innovation. So no matter who you are, you start with the things that came before you. Every artist is influenced by what they consume, uh, who they are around, and their personal origins, and it's impossible not to be. So great examples that probably you guys in the tabletop world would realize are things like John Blanche and the Northern Renaissance painters like uh, Bosch or Delacroix. You can you can 100% see the Garden of Earthly Delights in tons of Blanche's paintings, yep. and he's talked about endlessly how he loved the the chiaroscuro and the the style and the the, the sort of impact of those like early Renaissance painters. Um, and at that stage, you will mix, subvert, and blend what's in your head. Your version is almost always indicative of the ingredients swimming around inside you. The first forms and incarnations are going to be littered with both your own past ideas and the ideas of other people. Greatest examples of this are Warmer 40,000 and the million different winks of the past that are in there. So, like, what kind of references would you see in the Rogue Trader rule book? So, when you go all the way back to Rogue Trader... Yeah. Um, the Gene Stealers, they're not Gene Stealers, they're the Xenomorph from Aliens. Yep, yep. Um, the, uh, the Imperial Police, they're not the Imperial Police, they're the judges from Judge Dredd. Yep. Right? The Space Marines, they're not Space Marines, they're the Mobile Infantry from mm -hmm. Starship Troopers, right? Like, in the Ape Suits, yep. In the Ape Suits. Like, you've, you've got all of this. Like, yep. you've got tons and tons and the tons The Navigators are from Dune. Yep. The Emperor is from Dune. That elements of like cosmic horror, although they aren't in the Road Trader rulebook, they come soon afterwards. The warp. warp is from Elric, uh, the Stormbringer series, and then of course a healthy dose of Lovecraft. Yep. You've you've got these winks, and they're not 
subtle. They're not subtle at all. Right. You have Inquisitor Obi-Wan Clouseau, right? <laughs> like you've got uh, the, the sorry, Obi, was it Obi-Wan, Sh Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau? I think it's what it is. You've got Scotty the Engine Seer striking the runes of activation. You have all of these very self-aware, obvious winks being done on purpose because when you're first creating something, one of my very, my absolute favorite quotes from Robin Dews is he called the design team back then young men in a hurry. They yeah. were throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And one of the best ways to show to your audience, yeah, we're just like you, we're just making stuff you like, check it out, is to wink at the audience when you're creating Absolutely. about the, the influences that you have inside that creation. There's a, there's a stage where it's okay to admit that something came before you. Yep. Um, there's also some arguments that the name Gazgo Magurik Thraka is a, uh, well, one, it's black speech from Lord of the Rings. It's, a, oh, it's black speech. It's that. the black speech of the orcs from Lord of the Rings is the explanation today that Andy Chambers has given for that name, that he was, it was their like orc LARP that they were doing. Um, also that Magurik is, uh, that the iron fisted Magurik is Margaret. Because there's a certain certain prime minister in the UK uh, that was an iron fisted <laughs> considered lady in that, certain parties. That I'm pretty sure on every list of British PMs is ranked either the best PM in British history or the worst, yeah, and nowhere only, in there's between. There's no middle ground for that one, yeah. But like that, these winks are both obvious and and in there. Whether it's a Lord of the Rings wink or it's a political wink at the time is like a political satire. It doesn't matter. No. Right? It, it's that they're in there and they're written in there on purpose. Lionel Johnson, the Primarch of the um the whatchamacallit, the, the, Dark, the Angels. Dark Angels is the is Lionel Johnson, who's a, a writer basically, who wrote the poet uh, poem Dark Angel. Um you've got tons of this stuff in here. So it, that's basically, I think, the the first and conceptual stage of any creation of art is you're innovating. Now, some people don't put their art into the world at this stage. Sure. And some people come back to the stage when they get sick of making something. There's a lot of, you know, quote unquote, legitimate authors mm -hmm. who start off writing fan fiction. These Absolutely. Days, yeah, right? yeah. Like you're not creating new characters, new backgrounds, new settings. You're writing fan fiction that's inspired by things that already exist. Yep. There's and, nothing wrong with and that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's, I think that the, and, and the idea is that it can move past that once you get to stage two, but stage two, it, that's the pursuit of money or recognition, right? right? There, you get to stage two, you transition from stage one of innovation to stage two when something sticks, when those young men in a hurry who are throwing stuff at the wall, if we're going to keep using the games workshop terms sticks, how and so now we're going to shift gears away from Games Workshop. How many Marvel movies were made before Iron Man? Yeah, I mean, there's there's my example of like how many times did they try and make a Marvel movie before Iron Man? And I think the big the the big difference in terms of it catching and not catching is the question is less so how many did they make and what was the gap between each failed Marvel movie and yep. each subsequent next failed Marvel yeah, movie. Because the best Marvel movie, for those of you watching, uh, in my opinion, before Iron Man, is Blade. It's well, it, it, it's the only Marvel movie before no, Blade. <laughs> no, no. You know what? Punisher Warzone. It's not before Blade. Punisher War was in the 2000s. Blade's oh, like I thought you were saying before Iron Man. No, oh, so no, no, I mean, I'm talking about the best one before. Okay, you want to you hold up Punisher Warzone to Blade? I will tell you Punisher Warzone is a great movie. It, it had just the right amount of, uh, what's his name, of uh, Looney Boon Jim, Looney Boon Jim of, uh, of him and, uh, what's Jake the guy Saul? gets, no, who's the guy gets with the, the, the guy, uh, Mary Van Peebles. It had just the right amount of Mary Van Peebles in it. But I don't know if you can have any movie that includes Mary Van Peebles be the best Marvel movie. <laughs> no, he was in I'm, Jaws 3, bro. I'm sorry, I'm doing, can't I'm, do it. I was also, he was also in one of the many no, you know what? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna psychologically damage people by refer, <laughs> by referencing Highlander sequels. Um, <laughs> so no, it's Punisher people's... Warzone. You're just wrong. All right, fair enough. You're just wrong. But but you're there's nice so guy, many. Just wrong. There's so many attempts until something really sticks yeah. in a way that they stopped. And that's not to say that like Marvel movies are the start of innovation in Marvel, but it's them trying stuff until it sticks with that brand. If you go back before that, how many superheroes are on the cutting room floor that never make it to being like mainstream success right. in the, in the fifties, sixties and seventies, there are a million discarded superheroes that never actually make it out of that era. Cause they don't catch on the way that a Spider-Man or a uh, Captain America or, you know, the X-Men do. I would argue the X-Men only really catch on in the nineties because they are so in tune with the cultural zeitgeist of like the outside, 
outsider and persecution and like the progress being made socially in the 90s. I think the outsider and they also found as much as they had existed as a comic for so long, and, and we're going to get into this as we talk about our becoming brand, but they also found their mass media voice in the 90s with their animated series. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So so you've succeeded a bit. You've made something people seem to like. Maybe they've even paid money for it. Uh, but why? What did they like? This is where you get into codification. You are trying to four quadrant your creation and decide what the key elements of it are that people have responded to so that you can make that law. And at this point, you have to get serious and start to divorce yourself from the winks. This is the stage where you have to act like you made it all and it's all you. It's time to write it down, make it canon. Innovation slows down and the grins and winks start to end. You edit them out of your old material and you pare it down and invent new terms to encapsulate the things that people liked. This is where they stopped calling Arbides judges. They yep. started calling them Arbides. And this is the term everybody, well, I, a lot of people hate to hear as it applies to gaming, art, television, movies, books, whatever, this is IP. Yeah. This is this is effectively when you become an intellectual property in your own right. Yeah. There is a key moment in, I'd say, the late 90s, early 2000s at Games Workshop where this move begins to really happen. And the studio, there's a great article, actually, I think I shared with you on um, Goonhammer, talking about the moment where the studio stops being so much in control and sales starts to be in control. And that's, I think that is the divine line for Games Workshop where that happens. I think a lot of us as hobbyists, we're going to see that in terms of, we're going to see that IP change in terms of modern models, rules, books, presentation. I think for me, the clearest place to see it, and it's such a dumb little thing, but it's when they changed the names of all the paints. Yeah. It's when all the paints had to have a games workshop term right. in the name. Yeah. And, and so what you have is you have this moment where you you've got and i think another another good like example if you're hunting for it in the media that you like as you are turning into a a codified sort of like product and you're you're almost like solidifying when you start to invent your own terms for things that you might have previously had as being winks and you start to do things like um manage the the material around it so if if in the beginning it's an amalgamation of art and writing the art starts to gain style guides. You have a you have a less chaotic different artists in your book yep. and it starts to become like a unified artist in each book or a unified style guide. Um, same with like telling official ways of painting things. One of the great examples I think is the goblin green base. In all photography up to a, like up to a certain point bases were whatever. They'd be different yep. like shapes they'd have different surface material whatever it was because they were just grabbing any old hobbyist collection and photographing it to the theme of what they were trying to make all of a sudden you have everything's on a goblin green base with flock and not not only that but it had to be that way to play in a store so i'm going to tell you i actually my first disagreement with one of my higher ups at games workshop um was there was a standard for all your figures that went in your figure cases that went on your tables and it was goblin green bases and ironically, it was not flock. It was sand, yeah, painted, painted green. goblin green, yeah. and then highlighted sunburst yellow. Yeah. And the first disagreement I got into was we sold green flock at that time. Yeah. And I'm like, why would I paint sand to look like grass when I have artificial grass? Even if you want goblin green bases, shouldn't it be flock on top instead of this painted sand? Yeah. And I'm like, no, that's the rule. That's that's how it works. And the it's rule like, is the rule. And it, took it took Necromata to break that rule. And that is that moment where you kind of start to feel, <laughs> oh, okay, this isn't do the right, do, do the artistically correct thing because it's artistically correct. Do the thing because it follows the style yeah. guide. Yeah. And so second edition Warmer 40,000, the arrival of things like a codex. Um, and of course, Gaunt's Ghost and the Daniverse, where you had a lexicon at the end of terms. You would have radios before. Now you have Voxcasters, right? You had you had um, laser rifles before. Now you had las guns, right? You had this codification and language and almost like a like a bunch of idioms and stuff that came through that then sort of became entrenched in this is the this is the version of the the argument. And again, that was effectively the first and and not just uh the Tanith first, but the other guard regiments that appear in all those books. That was the beginning of guard regiments looking like something, even though they had no images, mm -hmm. and appearing as something other than 
Imperial Guard regiments all looking like an homage or a throwback to some real world military unit from some period in history. Yeah, to take one of the most, I would say, talked about versions of this that I can think of that's not in um, gaming media, I would say that the prequels in Star Wars are that. Metachlorians explaining the, the, the fall of the Republic, the Senate. All of this stuff had been allowed to be told a million different ways in all of the extended universe media, books, comics, yep. all kinds of stuff. And George Lucas, the creator, goes, no, this is how it happened. This is what it is. This is what it looks like. And writes it down, basically, in these three films. And codifies it. Discards all the winks. Discards all the other stuff. And says, no, these. this is the story the way it happened. These are the rules now of this universe. And, of course, when he leaves... That all goes out the window and it changes too. But that's, I think, the best example of a codification because he's going back in time yep. and setting the rules now that the other four, the other three movies have to follow. This is all, this was how it all has to relate to four, five, and six as well, right? And what's interesting about it too, to me, is it's one of those moments for a fan base. And in this case, we're talking about the Star Wars fan base, but sure. it happens across all kinds of different media. Where because people had their own headcanon built up around whichever pieces of secondary media they'd consume, be it novels, comic books, video games, whatever, the rejection from the fan base of, of certain things being codified in a way that didn't gel with yep. what was already what was already fact and had, had an extended period had been living in their head for an extended period of time, it's it's a moment where you're deciding to leave people behind to build something for the future yeah. and for good or for ill. And well, for Lucas, it was good because he made a billion dollars <laughs> because he decided to do that because he transformed what was previously three kind of slightly chaotic pieces of art that he'd made yep. into a brand. Now it was, you can argue it was already a brand, sure, but a lot of people played in that sandbox and it wasn't unified. People licensed it off him, but there was no guide there was no rules so much. He wasn't overseeing all of nope. it. it. You were allowed to tell stories almost freely inside that universe up until a point. And a lot of it was kind of fan fiction-y. And it's interesting because it was it was simultaneously self-regulated while also being the Wild West. Because most people who were choosing to operate in that space were choosing that based on the fact that they were fans of what existed yep. in that space. So they did want it to feel like it looked and felt and and belonged there. But you'd always get those outliers. And, and you get this across, again, we're using Star Wars right now, but you get this across all kinds of different larger franchises where somebody's like, no, I want to reimagine this as this or reinvent this as this. I want to tell a horror story in the Star Wars universe or, or whatever. There's a million cooks in the kitchen, so they can do that. Right. Right. And it's it doesn't have to fit a singular vision of what it's going to be or even have singular sets of rules. But that's where trying trying to transform from art into a brand becomes difficult because as you get broader and more chaotic, it's like, okay, hold on. What is our, what is our agreed upon what are shared the universe here? Yeah. yeah. What, what are our, what do our customers want? I will. You stop trying to make something for the sake of making the vision you're making and you're trying to chase what is being responded to the most by money. When people are being creative um, and you hear this a lot in work context as well, people encourage people to, to go outside the box. Yep. There's another box outside of that first box, and you're not actually supposed to go you're outside. Not, you of can't that go outside that box. one. And that box is just made of money. That yes. box is made of what are people paying for and what are they not paying you for. You got it. You're allowed to go outside the box as much as you want until you go to a wall that doesn't isn't made of money. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then sorry it's everybody. Done. Yeah. It's just to pull back the curtain, the cynical part of that is that's when that happens. Um, and the people that don't die poor. Yeah, but they made the thing they wanted to make, and that's okay. And then sometimes they get appreciated later on. We all have a, a book, a movie, a game, a comic, whatever we like. That none of our friends have ever heard of ever because heard it of. because it died in the dark, and that doesn't make it bad. And and that doesn't you know. But <clears throat> if you're growing, if you want to be financially successful, that's not that's not where you end up. And there's a ton of external pressure to success. Like if you have a successful property. And you're and you're out and as the artist or the people, the, even the collective of people making something, and it grows to the point where now the collective is financially like beholden to the success of this thing, and now that collective also employs other people who then prop up that making process and more people and more people. The larger that system gets 
the more you feel that pressure to yeah. make something that will succeed because it's based upon our previous success. And you repackage your, your, current, your current level of success and try and identify what the four quadrants are that are going to make it work in the future. If I'm making art for art's sake, I can be as successful financially or not successful financially as I'm comfortable with. That's fine either way. There's no hero. There's no villain. Yeah. As soon as I'm employing other people, then I'm providing people's livelihoods. Like I'm effectively allowing other people to buy their food and pay their rent or mortgage or whatever. And there's obligation that comes with that. Yep. And and catering to that obligation does not necessarily make you the villain. No, it doesn't. Absolutely. And success in that arena is how you get things that are considered classics, right? You're, you look at things considered classics because they have transcended the original art into being something that has endured. And so things that stand alone as classics are often forgotten about over time because they don't have a legacy and having a legacy for some artists is really important and they chase that and they yeah. want that to happen. Um, but you do eventually run into the edges of your own creation. And that's typically because once you've created something successful, you then have parallel creations that also make you money. So you have things like toy lines for movies. You have things like novelizations or books or comics or t-shirts or whatever that also have to be developed in parallel. And once you've established those four quadrants, you don't want to break out of them, yep. right? You, you, you have an audience, they make you money, and you are trying to continuously feed that audience to get them to give you more money. So stage three, and this is where almost everyone ends up at some point once the codification is complete, uh, is deconstruction. The edges of the sandbox are all drawn in. You've spent a lot of time making rules for the thing you've created. You've hit a wall as to how much further you can go without breaking those rules. You can't have it not be five minutes to midnight in the Imperium. It's always five minutes to midnight. The universe is always about to end in the Imperium for 35 years. It's, it's, it's always about to be over and you are teetering on the brink of extinction. The human race is constantly a candle flame in the wind about to go out for 35 years. So how do you do that? Um, you break the, you don't break the rules, you invert your creation and you invert the POV on your creation and you deconstruct it. This can be based on tons of different things like absurdism or subversion. You can change perspective or even reverse course on your own prescribed laws of what you think you've created in order to give a fresh take on the same ideas. Instead of winking at the inspiration, you're winking at the audience and saying, see, we get it. Here's the joke. So the stories and the POVs give an audience proxy in the universe and refresh all the codified properties. You have a, a, a basically a, you flip the sandbox upside down and you look at it from the bottom up instead of the top down. And there's a, lots of great examples of this, like the Caiaphas Kane books uh, in Warhammer 40,000, where you have the world's greatest commissar who is doesn't believe any of it and isn't really a commissar. You have turn signals on a Land Raider, which is a, a comic strip that they brought in, basically where the POV is from the miniatures point of view. They're miniatures that think they're space marines, and yep. the whole comic book is drawn from their point of view. Anything, Games Workshop Toy Story. Yeah, any, exactly. Games Workshop Toy Story. Anything Blood Bowl past like competition rule six, where it's just winking at itself. And then the Night Lords trilogy, where you have the Imperium and the Chaos Space Marines from the point of view of the ultimate cynics in the galaxy. Uh, and even a little bit in eighth edition with the return of Robo Gilliman and a Primarch from the Horus Heresy's perspective on what the Imperium's turned into and how it looks. That subversion and that like deconstruction you get a you basically get to reset the clock on your codification and do it all over again yeah because when you're when you're on the inside looking out as a as a character or as a construct you're you're neck deep in your own lore yeah and and that deconstruction stage lets you take a step back and even if it's happening in universe look at your own lore and i mean there's a point where you just look at something and say well that's just ridiculous that doesn't make any sense and when you put it within a certain context, it still works and preserves your sense of continuity for that lore. It doesn't. It doesn't take it away. It's. It's not one of those statements where you know somebody suddenly says this book, this movie, this comic are non-canon or some nonsense like that. It. It's saying, hold on, wait. Is this what it is? And then it lets you redraw those boundaries. Yep. However, you want to move the story. Yeah. And why it's important to deconstruct your own media is because if you don't do it, someone else will. They will do it for because, you. Because your media can be deconstructed almost freely 
by taking a absurdist look at your own creation. One of my favorites, of course, The Boys. Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> The Boys is The Boys is literally a Justice League deconstruction. It's right? well, and as you or go almost through, any superhero team. Yeah, if you, you go any through any of their because they basically picked every big team from DC and from Marvel, yeah. and they did a copyright friendly version of them, and then made yeah, they completely deconstructed them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know how many people out there who who didn't read the boys as a comic realize that's not a Marvel or a DC comic. Like that is them just taking free shots yep. at someone else's IP. And and an example of that same theme where superheroes deconstructed their own media is by the time you get to mid, I think it's phase two in Marvel, you have Thor Ragnarok, where they deconstruct all the characters, the yep. major protagonist characters in there in order to basically do it before anyone else does. Taika Waititi deconstructs the Marvel Universe and winks at everything that's going on through humor, levity, and the absurdity of Thor. Like, Thor is an absurd character, and he had, I think, really, of, of the series of movies up to that point, I think his movies struggled the most to be successful because he is a character that is on his face absurd. He talks absurdly. He acts absurdly. He's a man at a time. He's Hercules goes bananas. So it's interesting because it <laughs> plays completely, it, Thor plays completely into this whole discussion, which is if you are, you're Marvel Studios, because yeah. this is pre-Disney, the first couple Thor movies. If you're Marvel Studios, you've made Iron Man, you've had a huge hit on your hands, and now you're trying to figure out how to, and you've decided your end game is the Avengers. Right. So you have to introduce all these characters, but you've effectively lost track of what made Iron Man successful already. Yep. And it's you're trying movies to, in. and you're trying to figure out how to make a Thor movie successful, but you're looking at something else and trying to make it a formula, and it's not necessarily working as as what you think that formula is. But then when they go to Thor Ragnarok, they're effectively leaning back into their original formula they sure are. and it's working just fine. Just fine. And that's, and that's the thing is you, you have a character who struggles to fit the template you're trying to create, right? You have an alien who isn't relatable. He doesn't have relatable problems. And so you have to somehow create a, a situation for him to be Spider-Man so for you, him to have relatable everyday problems. You've basically. got, you've got this character that is based very loosely let's be honest, regardless as to how anchored the name might be very loosely on Norse mythology, sure. surrounded by these classic high fantasy characters. And your first move is to hire a renowned, famous member of the Royal Shakespeare Company to direct that film. It's going to give it a complete, you know, no disrespect to Kenneth Branagh. Guy's an amazing actor. Guy's an amazing director. He's not going to produce the same movie that John Favreau is going to produce. No, in any way, shape or form. No, absolutely not. I love Kenneth Brown movies. Yeah, so absolutely. Fantastic. <laughs> so so now you've basically bought yourself some time, right? You've you are still managing to four quadrant your 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 audience into giving you more money, but you've flipped it upside down. But eventually you hit the wall on that too. You 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 cannot. And I think you, again, if we're gonna if we're gonna show how that works, you can't subvert your own material off enough without it becoming tiresome and so you end up with a Thor Love and Thunder which is just Thor Ragnarok turned to 11 and no longer charming love the screaming goats <laughs> um, but there's a reason why throughout modern history there's a lot of franchises that you would consider successful franchises that have gone through periods of real dormancy and and we don't tend to think about that like most of us could not conceive of a world where Star Trek is not a massive part of the pop culture zeitgeist. Well, from 1968 to 1980, there was a crappy low budget animated show and nothing else. It's underground. At that that's point. that's like a 12 yeah. year period. It's under where it's completely underground. Almost it's just, nothing. Just indication. That's all you got. And and that's a difficult thing I think for modern audiences to to look back on. There's been gaps where what was the what was the gap from the last Timothy Dalton to the first Roger Moore, or uh, sorry, first Pierce Brosnan, Pierce Brosnan James movie. Bond movie. It's I, like I honestly don't remember. What was the gap years. between the last Pierce Brosnan movie and the first Daniel Craig movie? Like, there's periods where those, and it's not that those franchises are completely devalued, but they just they just go away because you've you've guessed or you've mined incorrectly for what made your, at that point, brand successful. And you've basically worn out your customers because once you hit the wall. Consuming the media feels like eating the same dinner over and over again. Yep. 
And that's where we get to branding. Um, without returning to like the innovation step and starting entirely from scratch, you are stuck playing inside your own rules and universes with artificial constrictions. Brands do not create art, they create products. You, you've basically become a thing that only ever refers to itself anymore. It's self-referential either through deconstruction or through codification. You're either following your own rules or you're flipping your own rules, but you're always inside the same sandbox. A new product cycle has to now start basically every time you want to make more money, and that's called development, growth, maturity, and decline. Now, we are going to come back to Games Workshop for a second because those four words encapsulate every edition of every game Games Workshop ever makes. They start in the development stage. They come up with, this is the way we're going to make it different this time. Um, late stage Warhammer 40,000, uh, I guess, probably had its best development cycle between 7th and 8th edition because they developed a bunch of ways to play inside their own universe with their own rules, yep. make it feel new by releasing previously referred to armies that we hadn't seen before. Then you have your growth. 8th edition Warhammer 40,000 completely reinvigorates the game, brings in new players, because it feels exciting again. Not because they're making anything new, but they're making products related to things we haven't seen in a long time. The Custodes, the Sisters of Battle, the Gene Stealer Cults, the Mechanicum, the Imperial Knights. All of these have been miniatures before. All of these have been armies potentially that you could play or units you could have in your army before. But because we're in a, we've, we've basically said, what can we do playing inside our own guidelines to make this feel new? We bring them back out and we re-release them. You get growth through into maturity. The game ends in a new edition called Ninth Edition. And, and, and at that point, they're already in decline. And the reason they're in decline is there's no new codexes to release. They've released a bunch of campaign books to kind of like tell a new chapter in the story. And it resets and goes back into development. You can see the development of the next edition happening when they hit campaign books in any of their major properties. Because they are buying time with those yep. releases to develop whatever the next stage of uh, uh, of, of the products going transparency to might be the wrong word because I don't know how intentional it is but there's a definite transparency to the process that you as a fan or a player can see when the end is on the horizon yeah right like and again you saw it with um, you, you saw it with the end times with Warhammer fantasy when it transitioned uh, transitioned or just completely reset to age of Sigmar yep. um, yeah but every every campaign, um, you know, it's funny that the campaign in, in 40K for so long, the theme has been it's two minutes to midnight because when the campaign rolls out, it's two minutes to midnight for that edition of the game. Yep. And that's it. And and, and it's it's almost self-referential in that way where it's like, yeah, it's here we go. Time to time to start over again. And the and it's it, it becomes, I think, for the consumer almost feeling cynical. And, and it's not, I don't think the cynicism is intentional. I think it is the nature of a brand to remix abandoned elements in, to try and make it feel fresh again, put a, a fresh coat of paint on it and restart the cycle because that is a textbook. And we're not making this part up. This is no. not that, that whole thing where it's development, growth, maturity and decline. That is, it, it's in your shoes. It's in, it's in fashion. That's why they say fashion is cyclical. Literally, they haven't made a new... They just cut blue jeans to fit your body slightly differently. They did not make new blue jeans. Everything you consume that is a product goes through this four-step process once it becomes a brand and you start to feel worn out because once, like Jay said in the beginning, you can come into this process anywhere. Yep. And for you, it's at the innovation stage. Yes. The product line itself might not be at the innovation stage, but that's the point is it's new to you and you're discovering everything for the first time. But the more times you repeat a cycle, that's where that statement comes from where it's, why doesn't 40K feel like it used to feel anymore? Why doesn't Marvel feel as exciting as it used to feel anymore? And the the, con the gaming context, I was recently discussing this with somebody in was Dungeons and Dragons. It wasn't in miniature games at all. Okay. And it was D&D recently released uh, a new beginner set. And uh, it's cool. Like, I mean, it's it's perfectly fine as a self-contained unit, but it's a it's a weird thing in the product cycle because every existing D and D player, like if you've been playing D and D for more than a year, let's say, I mean, it might even be shorter than that. You know, you're coming up on the end yeah. of this edition of the game. 
this new beginner product releases, which theoretically a lot of people who will like have heard about D&D or seen an actual play online are going to find very appealing because it's new, it's in mass market retailers, the price point's really good. There's nothing referential in there about where the game is going. And I don't mean there's a, not a big sticker on the front cover that says, don't buy me, I'm going to be out of date in a year. But what I mean is it it is completely encapsulated in the world of the last 10 years edition of the game and it doesn't include any any go forward material it doesn't yeah. include any any of what the the game is already built into itself but isn't in its core rules so for for a new person that's their day one and I can tell you, it looks like their day two experience is going to make them very cynical. And again, this is the this is the problem with not understanding these stages. I bought that product. I paid money knowing for that product, full well. knowing yeah. full well that it had a very short shelf life. And I don't resent what I spent on that product at all. I feel like I got good value for my money. Yeah. But if you don't know that your day one is two minutes to midnight, it doesn't build for a positive experience. Yeah, absolutely. So... That's, I think that's where this conversation, I think, holds value for you and I, because we, we literally, ha we hammered this out in a notebook last week where we were talking about what, how do you, how do you communicate this to people? How do you like kind of explore this idea? And how do you then recognize what stage the thing you're consuming is at a little bit with just a tiny bit of research? Yep. You can usually see a little bit about what where you're at with things. And I think that every successful company has to make this transition at some point into being a product. And you can either be on board with that or not be on board with that. Or you can say, maybe this time it's not for me and I'm going to pass this time. And the next time it comes back around, I'll, I'll dive back in and I'll, I'll be excited about it again. And I think, you know, we kind of touched on this before we started recording, that for me, the issue isn't that, that branding or becoming a product is bad. It's if it's just branding or just becoming a product, that, that's where you've really ramped up your cynicism. And, and we talked quite a while ago when we were playing um, Battletech Alpha Strike. Yep about how the thing that amazes me the most about the Alpha Strike product line is it's the magic trick that no other gaming company seems to have figured out, which is that when Catalyst brought out Alpha Strike, they created this on-ramp for new day one people, but in no way was it an off-ramp for, for their existing customer base. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't stop releasing things for everybody else. They grew their brand. They grew their brand. They grew their, their customer base. Yeah, and no part of that, like it wasn't. It never felt to me like it was a just. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really interesting because that is an example of them doing something midstream. Because the last thing we should probably talk about is that while this can happen linearly from innovation through codification through into deconstruction and finally branding, it doesn't always happen that way. This isn't a law. This is a way of understanding a timeline. And this is a way of, of also noticing when someone's doing it midstream. Because there's a lot of companies, especially because of Kickstarter, yeah. and they're not even really companies yet, they're just a bunch of people who may have rented out some talent to give them the illusion of artistic creation, but they're trying to start by having a brand. They're people who want to be a brand rather than want to be an artist. That's they're, right. You, what we've talked about so far is people who come into this wanting to be an artist, whatever your art form is. It can be writing, it can be graphic arts, whatever. But you want to be an artist, and then over time you realize, if I want to be able to devote myself full-time to my art, I have to also be a financially successful brand because that's that's what's going to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. Or the art that you create gets fired into the world, you leave at some point, and then it gets turned into a brand. Sure. But the other version of that, what you're talking about, is the, the dark universe version of it <laughs> is, mirror, mirror. is effectively the person who is trying to create a brand, and they're, they're just, from day one, they're generating product. And the product, even if you have passionate people that you've hired, because they're not yeah. you, yeah. to create this product... The product is almost always stillborn. Yeah, absolutely. It's how you see so many IP-based board games, so many IP-based card games, uh, and they and they are they are IP first because what you're doing is you're jumping in midstream and going, here's an existing brand, I'm going to develop product for it, and we're going to not have to worry about the innovation, codification, and deconstruction because those three things have already happened for us off somebody else's work. I'm going to monetize gonna go this, but I don't actually care what it is, yeah, effectively. Exactly. Yeah, anybody renting an IP is basically taking a brand and then making a product for it. And that's, 
I think that's really useful for looking at the offerings they're available digitally online. A lot of Kickstarters and stuff like that that are brand based, they're based upon the idea that you are, all that previous stage stuff has been done for you yep. and we're just going to make a proc and shoot out there. And if you understand that in the beginning, that, no, that the people making this don't care about it the same way you care about it. They care about how well it fills the four quadrant boxes and how likely you are to spend money on it. They don't care about the subject matter some people working inside it may, but the ultimate shot colors in that don't. No. Um, and that you're probably going to get a one-time experience out of this. And that it's not going to turn into something long-term. You will then resent it less because you will understand it is a temporary thing. It is a thing that you can experience, enjoy, and then be done with and not expect more from it. Yeah. I find managing my expectations of products is the way I'm able to better enjoy them because I don't expect something they can't deliver. And it's okay because if you understand that, and, and it could be a one and done or it could have a certain amount of expansions, but there's a fixed finite endpoint, whether yeah. it's by time or, or by existing IP. If you know that, that's fine. No one buys a deck of playing cards waiting for the expansion that includes 11s, 12s, and 13s to come out, yeah. right? When you buy a deck of playing cards, it's a finite product, you're perfectly satisfied with that. Nobody buys a classic board game, a Monopoly, a Chess, a Checkers, a Sorry, waiting for the extra pieces and the add-ons. Like, you're buying it as a contained experience, and you know that going into it, so you're okay with it. If you've chosen to engage with that, you're okay with it. And there's, there's nothing wrong with these, let's call them IP renters, that, that create a finite experience if that's what they're selling it to you as. Mm -hmm. um, I think where people get frustrated is when they don't see, even though the, the person making it can see a finish line. There's a finish line. You get to that line, it's over. Yeah. And that's not in any way, and I don't mean broadcast in, in huge neon letters, but where there's no transparency to... You know, the idea that this thing is not an infinite thing. Yeah. And you're you not know, mad at the finish line when you hit it because you knew it was coming. No. Right? You're not mad that that's there. But us as, as miniature gamers and role players, we, we tend to always want more, which there's, again, nothing wrong with that. But if you go into a product type expecting there will always be more with no knowledge that mm, there won't always be more like this will this will be the thing that it is and then it will never be again. Or, you know, the other side of it is. This will be the thing. It's self-contained. It'll never be it again. Oh, actually, we're going to make more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, you know that you and I are going to play the Fallout Magic expansion, right? Because awesome. because Because you can have a deck of Garys. Gary? <laughs> Just Gary? nothing but limitless Garys. I get my security roach to kill those Garys. <laughs> <laughs> I got a plan. And we won't be mad at it I at got all. A plan. Like, no. we won't, like, we'll buy it and we won't be mad that it's done and no. it's finished and who cares? You yeah. can have dog meat, legendary goodest boy yeah. as your as one of your cards. It'll be fantastic. Like, I think, and once you go into it from that mindset, that's to me what I love the most about deconstructing this, or not just deconstructing this, but like examining this and defining it is I can approach my own hobbies and interests, movies, TV, whatever, uh, books and and just enjoy it like you can let go of the expectation that it isn't a product well that that's the question is the ultimate question is were your expectations met yeah the question isn't what is it how big is it how broad is it the question is were your expectations met mm -hmm, exactly and and one of the places you see that a lot outside of gaming these days is in movies where those movies are attempting to be franchises or broader shared universes because you may go into a movie and ultimately most of us don't care if it is part of a bigger, broader universe. What we're actually going into, into a movie theater to do is to enjoy the movie from start to finish. And if a movie is effectively a trailer for another movie yeah. or a teaser for something else that's coming down the road, somebody who just paid to enjoy a movie is going to be disappointed because their expectations weren't met. And it's funny how you can go back and examine media under that lens and see the ones that were made with no expectation of there being a sequel. But then all of a sudden you end up with the purge yeah. and there's like six purge movies and it's like, 
huh? Oh, you created something interesting and different and people want and more people of it. And people want more of it. And so a studio jumps on and says, we'll make six more of these. Let's go. And they'll be progressively more weird and worse. <laughs> It'll be great. No, um, second one's still the best. And then you have The Mummy with Tom Cruise where they were clearly trying to set up a monster verse and then it didn't hit the way they wanted to hit. So it immediately got canceled. And well, and the, it didn't happen and, anymore. And the other example for me is, is as successful as most of the Marvel movies have been and as much as Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man is probably one of the most popular characters in there can anybody honestly tell me Iron Man 2 wasn't just a trailer for the broader Mar Marvel Cinematic Universe exactly, that's, yeah. that's not a good self-contained movie yeah. yeah it's a four quadrant box yeah. basically you're ticking a continuity box uh, and also making it relatable enough that you can sell some hold on a minute I need, uh, I need to get Black Widow in there and, uh, and War Machine who are those characters doesn't matter you're going to see them later I mean Secret Wars is literally a action figure sales pitch. Yeah. Like it's, we're at the deconstruction phase so hard right now. And that's why you get terms. Like I think subconsciously we get it. I think you get these terms, these internet slangs and memes like the Marvel of it all or the, the Disney of it all. Right. You know what I mean? And I think everyone's trying to chase the magic of being an excellent brand manager like Disney is. Yep. I think Games Workshop is an excellent brand manager. Absolutely. I think they've made, uh, they've, they've shotgunned out licenses to the point where there are only two kinds of Games Workshop video game. Either Game of the Year games or maybe all time games and then the rest and then the mobile <laughs> the games. The rest of the games. For every, for every like Warhammer 40 thousand tacticus you know what i mean you get a uh, uh it was it's um a uh a vermintide 2 or you get a dawn of war one I, or one of these like, i can't afford the good game what does uh what does eb have in the bargain bin that's that? right yeah yeah i'm gonna play i'm gonna play the space marine squad game for the game boy ds <laughs> that i think you gave me because it was on your desk and you were like i'm never gonna play this take, take this, this. Take this. <laughs> squad leader or something like that i think it was get away called. from me filth that's right yeah i'm gonna go watch the the, the, the opening trailer movie for Dawn of War again. <laughs> so, I, hey, I hope you guys enjoyed this. We're going to be back with more of these, um, and this is going to be a video that's part of the starter pack for Grimdark Media that we'll probably reference a lot. Uh, so I hope you guys made it to the end of this and that uh, you come along with us for the ride because we're going to start breaking down Lots of things in this context. It'll be games, it'll be movies, it'll be books, both inside and outside tabletop, uh, inside, outside movies, and inside, outside of just like the literature comic books that we enjoy. Because this is this is a broader spectrum thing, I think, than just are the games we like. This colors everything. I think the big thing is what I, what I would like to, and I, as completely foreign a concept as I'm pretty sure the internet in general is going to find this, I would like to put into the universe the idea that you can be informed about products you're buying without being inherently cynical or a stand for yeah, them all the time. That's right. There is there is another position to take. Yeah, it doesn't have to be full stand at all times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I think that that's, it's funny because there's no, it, it, I, algorithmically, what we're doing is so like prone to failure. You're like gonna we, die in the void. You're gonna die in the void. No <laughs> one's gonna hear this. We could be screaming in eternity. And that's why I think one of the things that I'm happy about is I wanted to make this for me, not just for you guys watching, because this helps me keep an even keel about all the stuff that yeah, we're we gonna in the future. I wanna talk in a realistic, grounded way about like I mean we we talk passionately about things that we enjoy, which mm -hmm. is awesome. I, I want to be able to talk in a reasonable, rational, not inherently positive or negative way about products as products. Exactly. Yeah. And art is art. And yeah. I think both those things have value. And knowing where they are in the life cycle is a way of like just being happier about the yeah. things you like and not being mad at it. You know what I mean? I can watch a really shit movie and have a really good time because yep. I realized that that guy made that movie for $25,000 and it was, it was something I enjoyed. I'm going to be honest with you. When I bought Poultry Geist... I was not expecting The Exorcist. I know, I, you know, no. Thanks Killing was not a movie that I, I, I got. I be. got what I showed up for when I bought that. Movie. <laughs> Thanks Killing Night of the Turkey Dead was not a <laughs> was not a movie that I expected to be more. I, I milked a lot of value out of the four ninety nine that 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 it was in the bin at that gas station where I found it. <laughs> I still. I got to be honest. Still looking for them. Uh, but I still haven't seen uh, Alpacalypse or Lamageddon. No, I definitely I, want to see. No, those. definitely not. Although you know, what we should watch at some point for Grim Dark Media because it is tangentially related to the wargaming industries. We should watch Yin Yang again because I still have my copy. Of oh, it. I do too. Okay, yeah, I do too. Yeah, for those of you that don't know the the wargaming uh, association of Yin Yang, Bo, if you're watching this. <laughs> We both still have our coffee. Maybe you know what? Maybe we do that as a series because we do we do that, and then was dead at the box office. The one that uh, 
Yeah, we could do that at the box office. Yeah, yep, that's another one. Uh, we could watch the Games Day movie for for uh, for Mark and, and and watch all of the like yeah, uh, the, the 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 was the costumes that Mark Bedford made for the Games Day 40k movie, yeah, which is really something. Too. It's only about five minutes long. We can probably see it on the internet at this point too. But I think I still have my VHS copy somewhere. Sweet. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll be back with more Grimdark Media. Next time, I'm Ashton. This is Jay. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed that video and thank you for watching. If you want to find out more about me and see what I'm up to, you can check me out on Facebook at facebook.com slash out of the basement into the streets or Instagram at Gorilla Miniature Games. You can also find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Gorilla Miniature Games. And of course, you can now follow on Patreon if you don't want to back and see what's new. Thanks for watching.